Hi, my name is Moby Parsons, and I'm an orthopedic surgeon at the Knee, Hip, and Shoulder Center in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. Our practice is located directly inside uh, Portsmouth Hospital, and we specialize in joint replacement and rapid recovery joint replacement, including same-day surgery, which we've really pioneered. And now, about 50 to 60 percent of our patients are leaving the hospital the same day, avoiding hospitalization. Uh, through the use of better surgical techniques and a rapid recovery protocol. I'm going to talk today about a new approach for a total hip replacement called the SuperPath approach or the superior percutaneously assisted total hip. This operation dates back probably about 18 years, around uh, the year 2000 or the early 2000s, and it's a hybrid of two novel approaches. The first was the superior capsulotomy pioneered by Stephen Murphy at New England Baptist Hospital. And capsulotomy means division of the capsule. Superior means coming in directly from the top as opposed to the front or the back. Percutaneously assisted total hip or the path approach was being developed uh, around the same time. And the concept of percutaneous means through the skin or using small windows to provide access to the anatomy. The aims of this hybrid approach is to allow us to do this operation with less tissue disruption, improved early stability by preserving more of the capsular ligaments around the hip, improved walking mechanics by limiting dissection of the important muscles around the hip joint, and early mobilization and pain control using minimally invasive techniques. When you think about the ideal surgical approach for a hip replacement, there are several factors that are important. One is that it needs to be extendable if necessary. There are situations in hip replacement where exposure can be difficult through very small incisions and occasionally we need to extend our incision and our dissection to get better exposure of the joint or the top part of the femur bone. Certain other approaches can be very difficult to extend because of limitations in the surrounding anatomy and this can be problematic if the surgeon needs to get wider exposure but is limited by the approach that they have taken. The superpath approach is very easily extendable and is not limited in that regard. Furthermore, we want to be able to use any femoral component design, so there are many different designs on the market, and not every design is appropriate for every patient. So patients' femoral anatomy can differ according to the thickness of the outer shell of the bone and certain types of conventional implants may not fit inside the canal of the bone well, leading to problems with early loosening. Certain approaches like the anterior approach always require the use of a wedge-shaped curved stem because of the challenges of accessing the femur through that approach. The superpath approach can allow the use of any femoral component design so that we can customize the implant selection for the patient's anatomy. We definitely want to be able to preserve as much soft tissue around the hip joint as possible because this preserves stability of the joint and allows patients to do things more quickly and more actively after surgery. It also provides less soft tissue disruption, causing less pain. We want to be able to close the structures anatomically at the conclusion of the case, so any capsular division uh, if we can close that, again, improved early stability. We want to be able to easily assess our leg length at the time of surgery, as well as take the hip through a range of motion to make sure that it is stable at the time of surgery before we close it. And this can be difficult with, with approaches like the anterior approach, where the patient is on a special table and the leg is locked into a traction device that limits the surgeon's ability to trial it and stress it and make sure that everything is stable prior to leaving the operating room. We also want to not have to rely on the use of intraoperative x-ray during the case as this provides radiation exposure to the patient but also the surgical team. And certain approaches like the anterior approach do require the use of intraoperative x-ray for cup positioning. 
Next, we want to be able to place the incision in an area that is clean and easy to access and easy to heal. Uh, the anterior approach, those incisions can sometimes be underneath the patient's panis. If patients have a fat roll that overhangs the belt line, sometimes that incision can be buried up in that roll, leading to a higher risk of infection or wound healing problems. We want to be able to perform this approach in all patients and not have any specific contraindications and also not to have a very steep learning curve so that surgeons can adopt this very easily without having to go through tens of cases to, to learn how to do this. It's also ideal if we can keep our incisions away from any neurovascular structures, obviously, and and finally, if we can do these operations without the use of special tables or table attachments, that is also ideal as these tables can sometimes cost the hospital upwards of $150,000. So the superior approach really satisfies all of these uh, criteria, which, which again makes it an ideal surgical approach for really all comers. There's, there's very few indications where it cannot be done. One specific one I can think of is if patients have prior hardware from an old hip fracture that may be difficult to fix through a, a super path approach, but just about everybody else is a candidate for it. If you look at the picture on the right, this shows a uh, picture of the hip anatomy. So this is taken from the back or a posterior view. What you see here are the muscles on the back of the hip joint. So the gluteus medius, which is one of the important hip abductor muscles, has been reflected away in this picture. And beneath that is the gluteus minimus. Preservation of these is critically important during the operation, as these are the muscles that help stabilize the pelvis and power range of motion of the hip. So whatever approach we do, we definitely do not want to violate these muscles here. The superior approach comes through an interval between the gluteus minimus and the piriformis here. The piriformis is the only muscle that has to be taken down during this approach, and we do repair it at the end of the case. The posterior approach requires the surgeon to release all of these short external rotators on the back of the hip joint. And although they are repaired at the end of the case, you can see there is more violation of the muscle and the underlying capsule from the posterior approach than if we can just release the piriformis and leave all of this intact. So the principles of this operation, it is muscle sparing, it is capsular sparing, and probably the most compelling uh, reason to do this approach is that it does not require dislocation of the hip joint during surgery. Every other surgical approach to hip replacement requires full dislocation of the hip joint during the operation, which can be traumatic to the muscles and the capsule around the joint. This is anatomical specimens looking at the hip capsular anatomy. So like most of our major weight-bearing joints, there is a watertight capsule around the joint. So the hip joint is located in here. This is a view taken from the front. The femur bone is here. This is the pelvis bone here. And the capsule is the, is the structure that completely surrounds the joint. Here's a posterior view looking from the back. And this capsule is reinforced by these broad bands or ligaments. This is the pubofemoral ligament here, the iliofemoral ligament, and the ischiofemoral ligament. And these ligaments are important to provide immediate stability of the joint. So the less we can disrupt this tissue when we do this operation, the better. You can see through an anterior approach, all of this has to be violated to get into the joint here. So the pubofemoral ligament is released during the anterior approach. Through the posterior approach, the entire ischiofemoral ligament is released and reflected. But you can see there's really no ligaments superiorly. So if we come straight down from the top here, we can divide our capsule here and leave all these important ligamentous structures intact. This is a schematic here showing commonly, a, commonly used approaches for total hip replacement. Again, you can see the posterior approach here. This is probably the most widely done approach to total hip replacement. It comes in through the back where the gluteus maximus muscle is split here. And again, 
as seen in the previous picture, the short external rotator muscles on the back of the hip joint have to be released to gain access to the joint. Not shown in this picture is the sciatic neurovascular bundle, which is located around here, so fairly close by to the posterior approach. The anterior approach comes down between muscle layers. This is the tensor fascia lata and the rectus femoris muscle here. And although it doesn't require release or division of any muscles, you can see that it, it does take a perpendicular approach to the joint. And it does not have a direct shot at the acetabulum. Therefore, in order to get into the hip socket, the femur has to be dislocated anteriorly and the femoral head resected. You can also see it's a slightly longer distance between the skin, particularly if people have a panis, as mentioned, or a fat roll anteriorly. This incision can sometimes be up underneath that roll. The superior approach comes in directly from the side here. You can see there's a straight shot right into the hip socket. We can resect the femoral head without dislocating the joint. And this gives us an inline approach to the femur as well as the hip socket, allowing us to do this in a minimally invasive fashion. You can also see that it's closer to the skin and there are no neurovascular structures immediately around this incision. One of the things that we like to do before total hip replacement is a process called templating, where we can choose the type of implant that we want to use, the geometry of the implant, the size of the implant, and all the features that will allow us to restore the patient's leg length, get a stably fixed total hip replacement, and restore the offset. The offset can be thought of as the distance between the bones here, and essentially what it equates to is the abductor moment arm or the power of the hip abductor tendon, which we want to keep at the optimal length. The red circle here is the center of rotation of the hip joint, and we want to restore this as closely as possible by putting the cup down against the inside wall of the hip socket. You can see there's bone spurs that have built up in here, and we want to be able to take those bone spurs away. And we want to put the femoral implant at the appropriate height here so that we can restore the center of rotation. And this will get our offset to zero and our leg length changes to zero, which is exactly what we want. You can see that this femoral implant fits very nicely inside the canal of the femur here. And again, here is a case using a completely different femoral geometry because this patient has very thick, what are called cortical walls to the bone here. The canal of the femur bone is very narrow and wedge shaped stems like this one may not always fit in canals like this one over here. And so we want to be able to use a different geometry stem to get early implant stability. And again, this is where the superior approach really shines because we're not limited in stem geometry as we are with an anterior approach. So you can see again here with this combination of implants that I've selected, we can get our leg length and our offset to zero change. The implants that I like to use uh, are made by a company called Microport, which makes the uh, implants, instruments, and retractors that are necessary to do this operation in a minimally invasive fashion. We use what's called an acetabular shell. This is made out of titanium and has a porous surface on it. So you can see there's little micropores in this material here, which is called biofoam. And when this is impacted into the prepared socket, this provides early stability of the implant. So this device will not move and the bone will eventually grow into these micropores providing biological fixation. The liner is most conventionally made out of uh, polyethylene, which is an industrial grade high density plastic with very good wear characteristics and also very biocompatible. So the body tolerates it very well. Some liners can be made out of uh, ceramic, which can be used in particular uh, scenarios if necessary. And these liners come in what are called neutral liners. They also come in what are called hooded liners, which can build up certain um, the height in certain directions to help prevent dislocation. 
The ball is most uh, conventionally made out of either ceramic or metal. We typically will use a ceramic head because there are fewer problems with metal against metal corrosion. This ball is impacted onto this stem taper right here. Ceramic is also very biocompatible. It's been around for a long time. It has excellent wear characteristics, and so it makes a very good bearing surface for total hip replacement. The stem that I most commonly use is called the Gladiator Plasma Classic Stem. It is also made out of titanium and also has this very porous, gritty surface at the top where the bone will grow into the implant here. This is a uh, very tried and true hip stem design. Just about every manufacturer makes a comparable stem design, and these have an excellent track record over years and years of use and have proved to be very durable. In terms of how we position the patient during this operation, the patient is positioned as if lying on one side in a comfortable sleep position. We use something called a peg board to help position. So it's a plastic board with some supports here that keep the patient in a lateral position during the case. The operative leg is slightly rotated internally by putting the foot up on a, uh, on a table as shown there. And this does not require any excessive stress on the surrounding tissues. If you compare this, the posterior approach is also done with the patient lying on their side, but you'll see with the posterior approach, in order to get access to the femur bone, the leg has to be rotated around uh, so that the foot is facing up towards the ceiling. This is a very non-physiologic position for the for the hip joint to be put in and the leg during the case. And it uh, increases the potential risk of instability since the hip is being dislocated at the time of surgery. You could argue that there is a potential higher risk that it could dislocate postoperatively. So the more that we can avoid having to put the hip in these non-physiologic positions, I think is, is favorable. This is a picture showing the anterior hip replacement or the direct anterior hip replacement. And this operation conventionally requires the use of special tables. This is called a HANA table. And you can see the leg is placed into a traction device on a long runner with a ball joint. And again, like the posterior approach, this, this particular hip approach requires the leg to be put in non-physiologic positions of extreme extension and external rotation up to 90 to 100 degrees, which the hip normally does not do that. And so again, this provides for more stress on the soft tissue at the time of surgery. And in order to expose the femur and get it out of the wound to allow the hip stem to be put in, oftentimes significant releases of the capsule have to be done on the back part of the femur. And so the contention that this approach is capsular sparing is really false because many times that capsule gets released to provide adequate exposure and those tissues are not repaired at the conclusion of the case. The skin incision for the suprapath is directly uh, in line with the femur bone. This circular area marked here is called the greater trochanter, which is the top part of the femur and the incision goes about a centimeter below that tip to uh, a couple centimeters above it. In general, we can do this in about a credit card size incision, so somewhere between three and five inches, depending on the size of the patient. And this is definitely less invasive than some of the other old conventional approaches, like older posterior approaches. Patients would oftentimes have six to eight inch incisions or sometimes longer. This is a, a video showing the minimally invasive hip joint exposure, skin incision in line with the femur. This can then be retracted. Superior muscular layer is divided but not detached. So there's natural planes in the muscle that can be retracted side to side. There's a small bursa that can then be taken out. 
and beneath that is the piriformis tendon and muscle and the short rotators. And again, those short, short rotators do not have to be dissected off. Retractors can be put in between the piriformis and the gluteus minimus, and that is the superior capsule there that is being divided. And those retractors can then be placed into the joint around the ball with minimal disruption. Because we are in line with the femur, it means that we can prepare the femur by opening it with a drill without having to dislocate the joint. So you can see, unlike the other approaches, the hip is still in the joint and has not been dislocated at this point. This allows us to do all of the preparation of the femur by keeping the leg in a comfortable neutral position without having to pull the ball out of the socket, which can provide for disruption of the capsule and the other muscles around the joint. Again, our trial stem and all of our femoral preparation can be placed without dislocating the hip joint. Once this trial stem is in place, it then provides a template for us to cut the femoral neck and remove the femoral head without having to place the leg in non-physiologic positions. So again, this is, this is a very innovative approach by allowing the patient to stay in a comfortable resting position during the entire operation. And again, for both the anterior and the posterior approach, the hip has to be completely dislocated to get access to the femoral canal. And the leg has to be forced into non-physiologic positions to get this trial stem in to do the operation. Again, our, our trial stem can be used as a template, so we can seat this to the appropriate depth based on our templating, and then run the saw blade directly over that neck to resect the femoral head. We can then place these pins into the femoral head and rotate it into the appropriate position and remove it, and then gain access to the hip socket. We can then remove the labrum around the hip socket and place in further retractors that give us an excellent view into the hip socket. Now the percutaneously assisted portion of this operation deals predominantly with the socket preparation. And so a cannula is a small, long, thin metal tube here. And this cannula is placed percutaneously or just through a small window in the skin. This can be about one centimeter incision just behind the femur bone and slightly below the incision. And we can then direct this cannula through this small one centimeter incision so that the tip of it comes into the hip joint inferiorly, just making a small stab hole in the capsule without complete violation or disruption of the capsule. And then our instruments that we use to prepare the acetabulum or the hip socket and impact the cup can be placed through this cannula while those reamers and the cup can be placed through the superior incision. This gives us an inline shot directly into the hip socket that allows us to keep the leg in a comfortable resting position and not have to crank the leg around an extreme rotation to get access. Here's another video just showing how this is done. So this device is used as a targeting guide. We put a ball on it. This ball is slipped through the superior incision and then this serves as a guide to show us where to make a small incision below the main one. We'll then make a one centimeter incision there and then this sharp tip, what's called an obturator, can be used to penetrate the inferior hip capsule. That obturator can then be removed and the cannula then stays in place here, allowing us to pass instruments through to prepare the hip socket. This video here will show the reaming. So this is a reamer that we use to remove bone spurs from inside the socket. You can see the reamer handle comes through the cannula here, and here we can then remove the reamer. 
and we can impact our final cup. So the final cup can be placed through the small incision superiorly, directed into the appropriate position, and then impacted by placing the impactor through the cannula and seating that cup fully into a stable position without having to extend the incision further down. So very innovative technique using small windows to get the instruments in the right position without having to dislocate the hip joint or without having to stress the position of the lower extremity. Once we have all of the, once the hip socket is in place, we can then place what's called a trial liner and a trial head based off of our templating. And we can then put the ball and socket together and then we can take it through a range of motion to determine the stability. And once we're comfortable that we have the correct combination of implants, we can seat the real one, place the real liner inside the cup and the real head on our stem and reduce the joint or put the ball back in the socket. And that concludes the case. And you can see that the leg remains in a, in a very comfortable position there, very minimal manipulation of the patient. At the conclusion of the case, we then can repair the piriformis, close the superior capsule, close the muscle on the way out, and then close the skin. We use a skin closure with absorbable t uh, stitches and skin glue and a waterproof dressing that allows us to uh, um, not have to use clips or staples and patients can shower early. So the theoretical advantages of this approach, faster recovery by virtue of preserving all of the key anterior and posterior capsule ligaments and muscles. This causes decreased swelling of the thigh and the leg. Greater flexibility because of rapid recovery, allowing aggressive physiotherapy with few hip precautions rapid functional return due to limited muscle dissection, decreased risk of transfusion by avoidance of dissection of the blood vessels on the posterior and the anterior part of the hip joint where many of those vessels penetrate the capsule, and also decreased risk of excessive leg lengthening because we don't have to dislocate the hip at the time of surgery. It requires uh, uh, less stress to the soft tissue and it leaves all of the hip restraints in place. This is what a finished product looks like here. This shows cup in excellent position right down to the inside wall with a nice closure angle here. We want that at about 45 to 40 degrees, which looks good. You can see this stem fits nicely inside the canal of the bone here. You can see that our leg length has been restored nicely and the offset looks perfect. In a latest analysis of the literature, the Journal of Bone and Joint Surgery puts out a, uh, a summary article every year called What's New in Hip Replacement? This came out in August of 2018, and this combines all of the latest studies and literature. And what they resolved was that the direct anterior hip replacement, which has become very popular, has more blood loss, higher risk of fracture, higher risk of nerve damage, an overall higher risk of complications. And so while that approach has become very popular, it is not without potential complications. So the complications and disadvantages of the anterior approach were those mentioned, but also wound drainage and infection. There is a higher risk of uh, blood loss and there's also a higher risk of fracturing the femur when putting the implant in. And in younger men, a higher risk of early component loosening, and that has to do with uh, not having the flexibility of using different femoral designs. Many surgeons transitioned to the anterior approach, not because they really felt that it was a better approach, but because patients were demanding it about five, five to 10 years ago. And this demand was not based on any scientific outcomes data, but it was, it was really based on direct consumer marketing 
by the industry in articles that came out in publications like the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times saying that this was how hip replacements had to be done. When comparative outcome studies finally came out later, what they found is that there really were very few advantages of the direct anterior approach, and in fact, several disadvantages as shown here. And the outcomes data have really never proven that it is any better than any other approach. And there are actually many surgeons who are now transitioning away from the direct anterior approach because they have found that it is not really value added to their patients. Yeah. Here's a patient of ours who is uh, just three weeks after surgery. She's 82 years old. She went home the same day of surgery. And here she is walking without any assistive devices on, back in her office in her first post-operative visit. And so I think this is, uh, you know, fairly remarkable when you look at how patients did uh, years ago through other approaches. Many of our patients would come into the office still using a walker at this period of time. And, and here's this 82-year-old who's walking around freely with really minimal pain. The recovery of the super path is, is you can wait bare as tolerated from immediately post-operatively. We like to get our patients out of bed literally just a few hours after surgery as soon as their spinal anesthetic wears off. The earlier people get up and move, the better. We do not institute a 90-degree rule uh, like the posterior approach where patients are not able to bend past 90 degrees, but we do recommend avoiding combinations of high flexion and rotation for a few weeks after surgery just to allow everything to heal up. We allow patients to get off assistive devices as tolerated, so canes, crutches, walkers, as soon as uh, patients feel comfortable without them, they can discontinue their use and essentially progress activity as tolerated. 50% of our patients are now going home the same day using our Avatar Rapid Recovery Protocol, which we will also post some videos about. And of those patients that stay in the hospital, 40% of those patients are going home on post-operative day number one. So certainly this is a, a rapid recovery type of uh, approach to total hip replacement. You know, four or five years ago, most patients were staying two to three days in the hospital. And I would anticipate that probably within the next year or two, 75% of our patients will be able to go home the same day, provided that they have help at home and, and do not have medical problems that need to be managed at the time of surgery. So in summary, I think that this is a very compelling approach to total hip replacement. And I think the main reason behind that is because it limits the disruption to the muscles in the capsule around the hip joint more so than any other approach. And I can say this because I've done every approach to total hip replacement. I spent about five years in practice doing exclusively the anterior approach. I've done the posterior approach for as long as I've been in surgical practice. And while I think that those are not bad approaches and I think patients can do well from any approach, I do find that the principles of the superpath approach are very compelling in terms of tissue preservation. And I do think that not having to dislocate the hip joint or put the leg in extreme degrees of rotation during the operation is very favorable to the surrounding soft tissues, to the concept of less tissue disruption and a minimally invasive rapid recovery approach. I'm now doing this uh, approach in probably 90% of my hip replacements. If patients come in specifically requesting an anterior approach, I'm still happy to do that. And again, for certain situations like pre-existing hardware, we will occasionally still use a conventional posterior approach if necessary. If you'd like more information on this, you can visit our website at orthopedicsnh.com. And I'm always happy to communicate with people by email. My email is listed here on this slide. And if you have any specific questions about this, feel free to send me an email and I'd like to thank you for watching this video.